Author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and I'm here at the University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington, with Jamie McGuire, author of Red Hill. Jamie, welcome to Author. Thank you, Bill. Jamie, you know, it's interesting. You, your writing journey began at, at about the age that most writers begin their journey, which is about nine. Is that right? Eight or nine? Is that when you got that, your first journal? I don't, well, yeah, I was in the third grade whenever I got my first, I was gifted my first diary. <laughs> yeah, and you began filling it up. Yes, front and back. And when that was full, I asked my mom for a three ring binder and loose leaf paper and just kept going. But eventually, uh, you were on a phone with a friend of yours talking about a blog you were writing or a blog you wanted to write? A blog I was writing, I had been blogging and she wanted to start a blog. Yeah. So she was calling asking for some tips on some topics and so we were talking about that and then my blog came up and she said, you know, you should really write it like a book, like a full one, a whole one. <laughs> Why did the blog lead to a, a novel? It's, they're very different expressions. What prompted her to say that? She just liked my writing style, I think. Yeah. Um, a lot of people commented that it, my writing was um, fun to read, entertaining, and spoke to them. And so the whole time you were, you were keeping your diaries, was the idea that you would write a novel floating around in your head, or was that brand new one your friend said, you should write a book? No, I had been chewing on that idea for about five years. Yeah. But you didn't study writing in school, you studied radiology, right? Yes. Very different, very different field. Yes. And so where was the writer while you were studying radiology? Well, I actually wrote my first book while I was in radiology school. You did? Yeah. And Providence was your first book, is yes. that right? And that was an ebook. Yes, I e uploaded it as an ebook in January of 2010. Wow, wow, that was 2010? Mm -hmm. Well, that's quick. And what was that experience like? Well, I wrote the book in 11 weeks. What? Yeah. What? I wrote Beautiful Disaster in seven. So, really? And so what is that like? Are, are you writing just at a flat sprint? Well, or? I was supposed to be taking, I was supposed to be taking notes in, in class and I was writing a book instead. Wow. But I still graduated at the top of my class. You graduated at the top of your class while writing a book in seven weeks and, um, well, and, and did you rewrite it or anything, or is it done in seven weeks? Well, I started the query process. I wanted to go through the traditional publishing route because I didn't sure. know anything about self-publishing at the time. Yeah. So I queried agents, and one agent gave me the advice that I should cut my novel down because it was the size of two full-size novels. Wow. The one you wrote in 11 weeks? Yes, 184,000 words. Oh, my God. All right. And so you cut it down? I did. And, but you couldn't find a taker? Well, when it came time to query again, I decided I just didn't want to. I just decided I didn't want to wait for someone to tell me that it was worth publishing. So I, I looked into self-publishing then. Obviously, it garnered a little attention. Yeah, the first, uh, I published mid-January in that first two weeks. I sold 17 copies and <laughs> then yeah. more and more as time went on. Yeah. Then I started writing the sequel. I'd already written Beautiful Disaster at that point. And while the readers were waiting for the sequel, I decided, well, I'll go ahead and, and publish Beautiful Disaster and give them something to read while they're waiting for Requiem. And the first two weeks, I sold maybe 40 copies, and the next month, I sold 30,000. Whoa. Really? Yes. And you said, I think I've got something here. Maybe. <laughs> maybe. All right, so now we come to Red Hill, but Red Hill is a bit of a departure for you uh, in that you've included the undead in your story. There's still romance in here, mm -hmm. it's adventure, but why, why tread this ground? This has been very well tread the last five or six years. Well, I actually came up with the idea when I was in x-ray school, and I was actually cleaning for one of the radiologists, just like one of the characters in the book, and that his farmhouse is the one that um, inspired Red Hill. So I came up with it before I'd ever seen The Walking Dead. I'd seen zombie movies, but right. The Walking Dead hadn't come out yet. So. And, and so you, were, you go up to his farm, you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, you know, this would be a good place to hole up when the zombie apocalypse happens. Is that, was that your thinking? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah? Okay, so how did you like writing about zombies? I loved it. I love zombies. All right, why? So 
teach someone who, who isn't in love with zombies why zombies are so awesome. Why are so Well, it's not really the zombie that's awesome. It's the survivors that are awesome. It's how you survive the relationships and how people change, their behaviors change when they're trying to survive something so frightening. And we meet Scarlett right away, and of course her great challenge is that her children are, are separated from her at this point. Well, I think something that hasn't been explored yet is, you know, apocalypse novels are out there, but, you know, there are so many families out there that, that do the back and forth every other weekend. And, yeah. and what if the end of the world came whenever it was your ex-husband's weekend? Right. Uh, how would you get to your children? That was just something I wanted to explore. And of course, when you write about the zombie apocalypse, you got to keep, I mean, obviously, I don't want to get eaten by a zombie is a big motivation, but then you've got to add other things as well beyond simply your imminent ugly death. Well, as a parent, um, at least for me, I feel right away that you're no longer living for yourself. I right. wear my seatbelt because in case I get in an accident, it's not for right. me, it's so I'm okay so that I can save my children. So I think for a, a parent, that's always the first thing in your mind when something terrible happens is to live for your children. Yeah, I mean, do you ever have the thing where you like watch movies about like Nazi Germany or something and think, God, what would I do with my little kids at that time when I can never picture it? I've heard that a lot from readers. After they finish Red Hill, they are thinking a lot about what they would do in that situation. And that, I love to hear that. I love to hear that they're still thinking about it when they hit the last page. You know, you, as a writer, though, you have to go to that place. I mean, you have to sort of become the characters and go through what they're going through, and they're going through a very traumatic thing. Does that, do you like going into that zone, even though it's harrowing and... Well, I have to. And that's, that's how I write. That's how I put the emotion into my book. I kind of tend to put on my character's suit, so to speak, and, and really feel everything they're feeling. And when they experience a loss, I, I'm crying, too, while I'm writing. And, and I actually had gone to uh, the farmhouse that inspired Red Hill the last few days to finish it. And you wrote it in the farmhouse? I did. I did, and I, you know, sat outside, you know, in front of the field where I envisioned this herd of zombies coming over the hill and, and envisioned other things, and it, it was frightening, especially at night when it's quiet. I'll bet it was. You're all by yourself. Now, when you're writing that fast, how often do your characters do things that really surprise you, where they go directions that you hadn't envisioned for them? It happens every time I write a book. I yeah. will have the entire book in my head, and as I'm writing it, it just takes on a life of its own, and the characters make decisions because I have to stay true to that character, they make decisions that I didn't expect. And then right. it goes in a completely different direction. So, so maybe some of the people sitting here now or watching on, watching on the YouTube uh, hear you say about your characters doing things you didn't expect, which might sound strange because you're the one writing it and there's no one else there but you. But describe what that is because it's a very common experience for writers to have their characters sort of take over and do things that they, the writer herself didn't understand was going to happen. Well, many times when I'm writing a scene, the character will say or do something um, very spontaneously. I, I, honestly, I can't explain it. Because it's, it's almost like there happened. is another person, sort, sort of another person talking yes, to you. Yes, you're, you're, if you stay true to character, you're, they're making the decisions. You're, you're not actually making the decisions. You might influence them, but I even have characters, um, for instance, in Red Hill, the character of Joey, he w didn't even exist yeah. before I started writing. So. And then he ended up being one of the, the major characters. One of the right. major characters, yeah. So I have one more question for you. Okay. And I'd like you to do is uh, finish the sentence for me. If writing has taught me anything, it's taught me what? Honesty. Honesty. Because you have to be honest to write it. If you don't tell the truth, I think the readers can tell.